let take it away, uh, Michael. Excellent. Uh, so thank you, Victor. Uh, it's great to be here and to, to see all you and hopefully meet some new faces. Uh, this is going to be a little talk about a new model for integer quantum Hall conductance that's challenging uh, the way that we thought about lattice models and some of the, the assumptions we had about Hall conductance. Um, so this is research I'm undertaking with my advisor, Xia Gang. We also have our thank yous to funding agencies um, and Xia Gang is on the line as well. So uh, yeah, this is a, a new audience for me because uh, I am you know, strictly from the condensed matter world. And so I've done a lot of work to translate things into the quantum language or quantum information language that I think is extremely powerful. Uh, with that though, you know, if anything's ever unclear or even better, if there's a new connection here, please uh, speak up uh, and you can either do so in the chat or raise your hand or just start talking. I, I love questions and I want this to be pretty dynamic. Um, I say, as I dropped my pencil. Um, so, not barring any questions, we have a certain plan of what we're gonna go through today. And for that, uh, I wanna start with just kind of giving a big overview of what's going on in condensed matter and translating that to quantum information. In particular, I wanna think about three sort of different classifications of states and how they uh, uh, interact. And then from there, I'm gonna get down into the Hall conductance. Uh, we're gonna review a little bit of the physics, uh, the sort of experimental physics of what's going on and the physical system. In particular, what we wanna to get to there is an understanding of the connection of quantization of Hall conductance and geometry. And this quantization and geometry is really gonna be connected by a symmetry that's one of the classifications that comes uh, from that first section. So there's a connection right there. And that sort of forms the introduction. From there, we'll be able to actually get down into the model. Uh, and the model is quite geometric. So for that reason, it's best to start with a space-time path integral version. So this is gonna be in two plus one dimensions. Uh, and we're gonna be able to see that this, this model has three very special properties uh, relating to its symmetries and its sort of redundancies and, and even another one that's, that's uh, a little bit more subtle. But those properties are what are gonna, what's gonna allow us to create a commuting projector model. So this uh, space-time model is gonna directly lead to or descend to the commuting projector model. And we'll see those three properties again. Uh, and those will now show up in what makes it a commuting projector model with certain symmetries. Uh, and we'll tie back to the symmetry we saw before. And finally, we're gonna come back to the question of this ground state and the geometry and Hall conductance um, and that's kind of the plan. So if that sounds good to everyone, if, if there's no further questions, um, let's jump into it. So I, when I was starting to write this talk, I had just read uh, Bob Lachlan's Nobel lecture. Uh, you know, he first explained the fractional quantum Hall effect. And in it, he points out, I think, what are some of the really neat parts of condensed matter? Uh, one of them is that condensed matter should be incredibly messy, right? We're talking about systems of 10 to the 23 particles. It's like a trillion, trillion almost. Um, and they're all interacting in, in some very complicated way. And I think the miracle of condensed matter physics uh, is that if you have this you know, system sitting in the laboratory and you're able to somehow tune its parameters, if you change those parameters a little bit, not much happens. There's usually a smooth mapping from ground state to ground state and excitations to excitations. Uh, on the condensed matter side, we call that adiabatic evolution. That, that sort of, you know, most of the time, if you change the parameters of a system, it mostly changes in a smooth way. Occasionally, uh, it'll change dramatically. And really what we're kind of stumbling on is the concept of a phase of matter, right? That, that water is the same thing at five degrees Celsius and six degrees Celsius. But if you happen to go from one degree Celsius to minus one, things are gonna change dramatically. Um, and so the sort of conceit of condensed matter is the actual systems with 10 to the three particles are usually very hard to solve. So I can imagine having some system, it's described in this like weird family of theories by some theory, and I don't know how to do it. You know, first principles, you really can't get at the calculation, but you can imagine adiabatically evolving it to a model that is soluble. So we do that slow change and somewhere in this space of theories, we find a model that is soluble and that we can 
uh, actually do some calculations on. And then we understand what properties of the soluble model are universal throughout the whole phase. So you know, can I make conclusions everywhere else? And those properties are gonna be things like symmetry and entanglement. That's sort of the condensed matter philosophy. I wanna translate that into sort of quantum information. Um, really, we're, we're talking here about sort of the complexity of states and a soluble model encodes the fundamental complexity of a state. So that'd be right here. But I also want to be able to add on top of that soluble model, a finite depth circuit. So, you know, and we'll get into what that means on the technical side in, in just a little bit in terms of locality, but uh, I wanna be able to sort of talk about a, a state of matter and classify them up to manipulation by finite circuits. Um, and then the universal properties I'm gonna demand are gonna be, you know, things like symmetry and entanglement patterns, and we'll get into those in just a moment. But while I'm on the topic of soluble models, that really brings us to this commuting projector model, sometimes called stabilizer models. Uh, and these are sort of like the, the Cadillac of soluble models, the cat's cradle. You know, they're, they're easy to solve because they kind of, I can just solve a little bit of the system at a time. So in particular, I now need some concept of locality and everything today is going to be either in two spatial dimensions or two space and one time dimension. Uh, and we're going to be either on a triangular lattice or a tetragonal lattice, sort of a tetrahedra everywhere. Uh, and in that context, locality really means that my operators have some finite range of support. So I can imagine these hexagons as operators uh, on the underlying lattice. So that would be like down here. And you know, this operator is acting just on a lattice point and its nearest neighbors at the six corners of the hexagon. So that's really what we mean by locality. And for a commuting projector model, I wanna be able to de decompose my Hamiltonian, my energy dynamics as some sum over local operators. But even more, I'm gonna ask that these local operators commute. So if I can solve one, I can solve all of them. And then I'm gonna ask one more thing, which is that they're all projectors so that they square to themselves because that makes it easy to solve one. And if I do this, I now have a tangible model of a phase. I can get the ground state. I can kind of do the whole thing. Um, and that's what we're gonna be after today. In particular though, it leads me to another uh, kind of question, which is back to this classification of phases as classifications of many body states. So uh, can I ask a question before Please go ahead. You mentioned a stabilizer, but by stabilizer, you just mean commuting like projector. You don't mean like they are poly operators, are they? No, that's correct. Mm, okay. I just mean a commuting sure. projector. Um, in okay. fact, the, because of the Hilbert spaces we'll be working with, we don't really have poly operators uh, mm -hmm. in the normal sense here. I see. I see. Well, rotors will have, you know, ex uh, in, uh, exponentials of angular momentum and, and angular position. Right. Be curious to see, and you can express anything you want in terms of those. So be curious to see whether it's an easy expression of your of your projectors in terms of them. Mm -hmm. It's an easier. It's an easy uh, expression in terms of angular positions, actually, um, uh, and that's what we'll actually write down kind of later on. So, um, but kind of vamping on this quantum information thing, you know, I, I want to get a control over the classification of many body states. Uh, again, with this notion of locality. So one question I want, might ask if I'm thinking about some state that somebody hands me is the first thing I wanna know is like, you know, is it a product state? If I wanna figure out how complex it is, can I just, you know, tensor up lots of individual systems um, and say that they're not, uh, you know, really interacting, not entangled in any way. Uh, that's sort of the simplest state. But in the context of what we've just been discussing in terms of stability of phases or up to finite depth circuits, I actually wanna say, is this a product state up to a finite depth circuit? Is it like a uh, product state? Is it deformable or transformable into a product state? And if it's not, then that's because there's really entanglement between you know, something here and something arbitrarily far away. So it's really that there's a long range series of entanglement and you know, that's sort of what we call on the kinetic matter side, topological order. Uh, the classic example of this uh, that is also a commuting projector model is Kataev's toric code. Um, and I think the beauty of, of that paper is, is why it's, you know, uh, 
what we want every, every new student in the field to read uh, and sort of the first introduction to these long range entangled states. But there's another one that's gonna be more relevant today. And that's, you know, maybe I can transform it into a product state, but only if I break some certain symmetry. So now I'm introducing the concept of symmetry and things aren't long range entangled. They're just entangled with stuff nearby, but it's somehow knotted in a way that I can't undo without breaking some overlying symmetry of the system. So things are without that symmetry, if I don't care about the symmetry, it's trivial. It's a, basically a product state. If, it, if I do require that symmetry, then things become non-trivial. Uh, and, and that's called a symmetry protected topological order or symmetry protected trivial order. Um, and the classic example of that is sort of the topological insulator. Um, um, Michael, can you go, the previous slide, I'm gonna go on a limb saying, I, I thought it's log, you need log depth to, to, to make some of these, uh, you know, non-topologically ordered phases. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not certain of the, the of the quantum information recently, last I remembered, and I could be completely wrong on this, so I encourage other people to jump in. Uh, you know, I really just want to cl classify things up to finite depth, because for us, that's sort of, uh, you know, the, the notion of like a local unitary transformation. Uh, yeah, I know, but, but the thing is like, often quasi-adiabatic evolution is used to justify, you know, going from vacuum to the state or to, as a tool to go from vacuum to the state. And as far as I know, to approximate quasi-adiabatic evolution, precisely, you need a log depth brick, brick layer. Um, uh, and I just want to make sure here, so you know, we're going from, from some sort of product state to another trivial state, not to a topologically ordered state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even like an MPS, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, so maybe we need to uh, change finite depth circuit to like a log depth circuit, but it certainly needs to be sub-extensive. Uh, and that's not the case that we'll see today. I don't think so. Like log depth, then you can like prepare Tori code as well. Like, yeah. Um, do you have a specific model in mind, Victor, for like trivial state that needs log depth? Well, I'm remembering this um, paper by Hastings and Ha where they did a Hamiltonian simulation algorithm, and uh, they were simulating e to the iht where H wasn't even quasi-local, it was just purely local, and they had, uh, there were logs in there. Um, yeah, Isaac is saying, I need, I mean log depth local circuit. Oh, yeah, I yeah. see. I think it will be local like here. like K-local, that's what. Yeah, this is. I see, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a bit of a messy question. Maybe we should just discuss it after. I'll just mention the gather town, uh, the Quicks gather town, I'm going to um, point everybody to there after the talk and we can have a nice discussion about this stuff, the details. I think that'd be great. Um, and I will for sure be there. And I think getting into that would be really cool then. Um, but I, I think that's still relevant for actually the next slide after this. So we've just said, you know, if, it, if I can't do it at all, then it's topologically ordered. If I can unwind this thing, but only by breaking a symmetry, then it's called SPT order. Um, and that's where we're gonna be today. But there's one more important thing and that's sort of like, you know, does this state have magic? Uh, and that's not my name, it's, it's like Katayas and Dryas, but uh, can I just deform this into a stabilizer state via finite depth circuit? And to your question, Ali, uh, earlier, I'm gonna use some sort of generic notion of just any computer projector model, not necessarily uh, the stabilizer of Pali's. Um, and if the answer is no, then it's magic. And if it's yes, then I'm gonna call it with a Harry Potter reference, muggle. Um, and so we have these three overlapping uh, series of classifications. I just want to kind of take a, a, a chance to look at those again, right? We have long range order where it could be trivial or topological. And that's sort of coming down from the top here. You know, I have trivial and topological. But then I overlay symmetry on top of that. And now symmetry can protect an order that was previously trivial or it can leave it trivial as well. And on top of all of those, we now have this question of muggle or magic. And um, right now, I'm gonna to continue to think about these all up to finite depth circuits. Um, I, I don't know if we needed to go to log, but I wanna get into that in the gather town. What is critical for us is all of these different triangles have all these different phases in them. You know, I could be in all these different phases in these broad classes. Um, previously to this model, 
we thought that anything with Hall conductance had to have magic. It couldn't be the ground state of a commuting projector model. Uh, so it had to be here or here or here. What this model was, and, and just to be honest, I totally thought that too. Uh, so when we found this model and we realized that this has Hall conductance and it is a computing projector model, so it's by definition, magic lists or muggle, um, I thought that was really surprising. And that puts us here. And it allows for a lot more interesting lattice realizations of things. And it can be uh, a cool direction forward. So that's sort of the big overview of how I want to think about this in terms of classifications or states. And before we get into a little bit of Hall conductance, I think this is a perfect time if there's something on your mind uh, please ask a question. Uh, I have a quick question. So yes. in your definition, where do you put a key type chain, 1D key type chain? Do you call it topological long range? Uh, yeah, so, so that would be long range ordered, right? Because you have this fractionalization of the Majoranas. So that's going to hang out. Um, I actually have to think not on my feet about whether it's muggle or magic, but that's going to be in this side of the column. And I believe it's here. OK, thank you. So let's jump over to Hall conductance now. Uh, this thing, you know, there's a lot of physics on Hall conductance and I think it's a, a pretty amazing uh, discovery. What I wanna focus on is this relationship between geometry of the wave function and sort of a high dimensional sense and what makes the Hall conductance quantized. Cause that's actually what kind of makes all of this very surprising and later uh, very effective and kind of simple. So in general, uh, I know we have people from all over the community here. Uh, Hall conductance is this weird thing that happens in certain materials when you apply an electric field and your current doesn't go anywhere like that. It goes orthogonal to the electric field, perpendicular to it. Um, it's just usually done with a magnetic field. That's kind of immaterial to us. Um, the important thing is that you apply an electric field and your current goes the other way. Uh, historically, this was often used um, to reveal the sign of charge carriers in a material, which I think it must have been crazy to get two different signs coming out of that. Uh, but for us, what is so critical is that in 2D systems at high magnetic fields, this is quantized. And to understand that, I'm going to borrow another one of Laughlin's ideas, and that's sort of his big thought experiment. Uh, so in particular, I can imagine instead of I can imagine uh, instead of a flat piece of material, I'm going to put it on a cylinder, uh, and my electric field I want to go around this way. That's sort of the, the same, you know, the nice version of what it was before. And I'm gonna realize that electric field by a time changing boundary condition along this direction. So my wave function of a single body state would have to satisfy something like psi of x plus lx is equal to e to the i theta x of t psi of x. Um, and when I change this boundary condition, you know, the Maxwell equation, or if I work it out, I'll realize that that's an electric field. But there's something very beautiful here, which is if I change this boundary condition slowly and adiabatically from zero to two pi, well, at the end, it needs to basically come back to where it was before. And in fact, the only thing that could have changed is I might have pumped a charge carrier from one side of the system over to the other. And that's my current. Right, I have my electric field going around and my charges are moving across. That's my perpendicular current. But because charge in our universe is quantized, it comes in these electrons, uh, the Hall conductance is going to be quantized. So in this way, it's a sort of geometrical picture that really reflects the underlying quantization of charge uh, in our universal fields. But there's a slightly more general picture here that's going to be pretty important, uh, which is was first kind of written down by TK and N, and, and, and this argument wasn't really fully proved until Hastings, uh, who seems to underlie a lot of this stuff, uh, which is I can now think about the ground state of a Hall system uh, as a bundle over this torus. So I have some ground state that depends on the boundary conditions, theta x and theta y. Uh, and it presumably, you know, I, I tune theta x and it, and it changes along. Um, the question is, well, I can think of this as, as basically a vector field or a vector bundle over a torus, because certainly the boundary conditions had better be periodic in each direction. Um, and now I have to ask myself, uh, you know, is this a smooth bundle over that torus? Well, it better be smooth as a ray. 
So if I go around the torus, I better have, you know, that uh, going around theta x brings me back to my original state. Uh, otherwise, you know, we would be in, in, in a, a strange situation, right? We're now, now changing boundary conditions by two pi that does something, but it can do so up to a phase. So these had better be equal up to a phase. And the question is, what about this phase? Uh, you know, if this thing is, is smooth as a ray field, as a field of rays, but not smooth as a vector field over that torus, uh, you know, I could have an interesting setup. And in fact, the obstruction to smoothness as a vector field is called the churn number. Um, and it's related to the flux of something through the torus and it's classified by an integer K. So there's really this, this relationship between the geometry of this ground state bundle uh, and this churn number K. What TKNN uh, pointed out and, and later I think Hastings really proved is, is um, or Finch proved of, that uh, this churn number is in fact the Hall conductance. So that's the critical part for us. And why it's so important is that that's the source of a no-go theorem. So uh, I, I really love this paper. It's a couple of years ago, Kapusta and Fikowski, um, you know, they point out if you have some Hamiltonian that depends on these boundary conditions in a smooth way, should I not get a ground state which also depends on those in a smooth way? In particular, I should be able to go around and change either of these by two pi and come back to where I was with no phase. Um, they use some, some, I think, very beautiful mathematics in this paper, but that's sort of the basic intuition that if my Hamiltonian is changing smoothly, well, probably my ground state should be. Uh, I want to park this and come back to it at the end of the talk because we'll actually see how this model sidesteps uh, this discussion. But before we jump into the model, there's one last point I want to make kind of from the quantum information point of view, which is so long as I have this symmetry, which for us will be U1, I can twist my boundary conditions so I can define a Hall conductance. But Hall conductance is always just an integer, which means it cannot change smoothly. So now I have some, some notion of robustness. You know, I can imagine if I'm creating the state with the orange blocks here, the orange bricks, uh, I can let some bad gates slip in. And so long as they preserve U1, you know, they're not, if they're very weak too, they're nearly identity, they're going to uh, not change the churn number. And that gives me a notion of stability or robustness, just sort of at the biggest intuitive level. And that quantization is sort of the source of the stability of the model that we're going to see in just a moment. So now I think we have all the chess pieces out uh, and I think we can jump into the model, but before we get into that, any questions so far? So you're gonna show this is robust on the level of the circuit that makes the state? No, I'm not gonna like actually prove that. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm arguing that the, because the Hall conductance is quantized and it's defined so long as there is U1 symmetry, um, you know, then from sort of like the renormalization group argument, we expect it to be robust, uh, but we will not really get down into the, the notion of if I hit it with any operator, will this be, uh, uh, robust at the technical level. I think that's something that would be interesting to the computer science community to actually explicitly show. I would be very interested in working on that. Um, and I think there are very good arguments from the physics perspective. I hate to come in with my like wishy-washy just, uh, you know, intuitive perspective. Uh, but I, I think that there is a lot there, which would be really cool. Um, and in fact, we'll see some of the ingredients that one would use to do that in just a little bit. Uh, so. Hi, sorry, I have a similar question as mm -hmm. before. So, so do you consider the quantum hole as a U1 SPT? But I saw the quantum hole should be invertible. It doesn't quite need the exact U1, right? Uh, so yeah, there's a couple of elements to the traditional quantum hole effect. Uh, we're going to continue consider it just as U1 SPT. Uh, so, you know, we're not looking at any thermal Hall conductance or anything like that, just uh, a U1 SVT uh, with U1 Hall uh, conductance. Uh, so we, it's a slightly subtle trick that, that I'm kind of uh, pushing under the rug in the interest of simplicity. Okay, thank you. So now I'm gonna get into this. Uh, 
for better or worse, the, the, the best way to look at these is via a space-time path integral because uh, they're kind of geometric. And this reveals the geometry of what's going on a lot, a lot more simply. Um, so you know, if, if you're more comfortable in the operative formalism, I promise that we'll get there. Um, but it's the only way I can make this easy uh, is to start from the space-time path integral. And in that, uh, you know, we wanted to create a space-time path integral that's sort of interesting and maybe captures Hall conductance. Uh, and in order to do that, I want the space-time path integral to have something in it that's like the Hall conductance. It needs to have some integer, some parameter, which can only be an integer, and that I can tune. Uh, so to get towards that, I'm going to imagine I'm working on some space-time lattice, and I'm going to draw it in two dimensions. Um, but we're actually going to do it, you know, in you know, in one higher dimension. So extend that to two plus one. And at every vertex of the lattice, I'm going to put a little u1 phase. So I'm also going to work in units that are a little different than usual. This u1 phase is going to take values from zero to one, um, or maybe that not zero to two pi. And that's going to save me a lot of factors of two pi later. Um, but I can always go to the u1 variable by exponentiating it with a factor of two pi. And to make sure that this is genuinely a, a phase, I'm going to require a redundancy. So everything I consider had better be redundant by shifting any phi by an integer over my whole lattice. If I don't have that, I don't even have rotors. I don't know what degrees of freedom I'm talking about. So I better keep that. And in addition, uh, I'm going to have a U1 symmetry. So this is a redundancy, sometimes called a gauge symmetry. This is just a genuine symmetry. And that's shifting all of the phi by any constant amount. And when I work in terms of these, the, the first thing that, that I would write down is saying, well, look, I'll just sum over all adjacent lattice sites, and I'll make my action just the minus cosine 2 pi of the difference between them. You know, so this kind of says that uh, you know, phi i minus phi j, my, my energy is you know, right where these are equal, so it makes things smooth. Uh, it obviously satisfies both of these symmetries, because if I shift anything by an integer, well, cosine is left alone. Um, and if I shift them both by the same amount, well, it subtracts off between the two. But this doesn't have a quantized coupling. You know, J can take any values in R. So it's really not what I'm, I'm looking for. And to get towards what I want for Hall conductance, I had to introduce a little bit more technology, uh, stealing a little bit from the algebraic topologists. Um, and that's sort of the co-chain formalism. I want to figure out how can I build an action from lattice field variables. And they've worked this out very well. They have these things called zero cochains, which is really a function on the vertices of a lattice. So if I have my lattice here, I'm going to put my phi on every vertex. And then I could also imagine a function on the links of the lattice or the faces. Or if we're in 3D, like this one, I could get a function on tetrahedra. Uh, ultimately, that's what I'm going to be after, because I'm going to work in two plus one dimensions, right? So two space, one time. That's a three-dimensional lattice. And I'm going to want an action, which is sort of like uh, it's a number for every little volume. So I'm looking to create a, a two plus one. Uh, it's a 3D cochain, which is a function on every tetrahedra. And fortunately, the mathematicians have very good methods to do this. One thing I could do is I could look at, at any link, and I could build a function on links by subtracting the differences between two lattice points. Right? So that takes me from a zero cochain to a one cochain, from a function on the vertices to a function on the links. Uh, and you can actually do that in higher dimensions, you know, go from links to plaquettes. But you only get to do it once, because uh, in fact, this thing squares to zero. If you're familiar with differential forms, this is a lot like the D from differential forms. Uh, and it again squares to zero, this sort of lattice derivative difference operator. Uh, it also satisfies a nice uh, sort of uh, um, chain rule. And the last thing I'm going to need, I don't want to go too much into detail, is called a cut product. This is a lot like the wedge product from differential forms. But basically, it says if I have a function on links and a function on the vertices, I just can stick them together, or sorry, correction a function on links and a function on the faces, I can stick them together to get a function on the tetrahedra. These are the two things that I'm going to use. And this cup product sort of takes you know, an m cochain and an n cochain. This is a 1 and a 2 and gives me a 3, so an n plus n. Uh, I don't want to say too mired in this technology, because it's not the fundamental physics. 
But one thing that this allows us to do is start to talk about invariant quantities. So if I define the nearest integer to this, well, I can now look at a quantity like phi minus the nearest integer of phi, which is manifestly invariant under this rotor redundancy. And now I can start to look at actions, you know, where I say this is like d phi minus d of the uh, rounded part of phi, or I could do d phi minus the rounded part of d phi and I could square it. But now I still have things which aren't quantized. You know, this is manifestly always invariant under rotor symmetry. And then you could try something else. Uh, I, I could try something like this, d phi cup d phi cup d phi. This is a one plus one plus one equals three cochain. So I get to integrate it, but now it's not even rotor invariant. Um, so eventually, if, you, if I go through and I just write down everything I can, I arrive at this and, and this is the model. Uh, it is the cup product of d phi with d of the rounded part of d phi. Uh, and this thing has three incredibly important properties. And, and these properties are the name of the game for the rest of the talk, the rules of the road to make everything work. One is if I impose that rotor symmetry, it's gonna force K to be quantized. Um, it's actually gonna be an even integer because this is sort of a bosonic model. Um, and uh, I can extend it to a fermionic model, but I, I want to skip that today. It's gonna have U1 symmetry uh, and it's gonna be this sort of like weird non-trivial term that's still a total derivative. And we're gonna go through each of those uh, sort of in quick succession here. So the first thing I'm, I'm gonna do is say, okay, uh, for rotor symmetry, what happens? If I just shift this and I, I plug this in here, um, well, the first term, uh, if I just plug it in on this last, this last d phi, uh, this n sort of slips out of the rounding term and I get a d squared n and that goes away because d squared is zero. And what I'm left with is actually what provides the, con the, the uh, quantization because now I get to replace this with dn cup d d phi. I'm left over with a term like that, and that's here. And I want that to be one. And the only way for that to be one is if k is an even integer. So that's it. That's what I was looking for. I was looking for something that had to be quantized, and, and there it is. Uh, and in fact, you, like I said, you can make it fermionic. You have to do suspend structure, which I'm going to skip. Um, but I'm happy to talk about that at Gathertown. The next critical property of this is that it's u1 symmetric. And that's just that it's basically formulated in terms of lattice difference operators. You know, this is a phi i minus phi j. And so if I shift them both by the same theta, that cancels off. But now, uh, sorry, is there a question? Well, so you're, you're basically saying, okay, we can't just use cosines and sines and powers of those for some reason. Maybe you can tell me why, but so you're saying, okay, let's not use those. Let's have these things out there by themselves but by themselves, they can't be angles. And so if we subtract off this nearest integer thing, then they're, they're basically effectively angles. Um, is that right? That's exactly right. So um, the technical question though, like the domain of phi I thought was between zero and one, but you're still allowing to shift it by integers. So are you really thinking of phi's as the real numbers? Uh, so we're sort of lifting u one to r, but then making sure that the redundancy is still there. Yeah, right, uh, via the, okay. Gotcha. So I think a critical portion is, is this integral, um, it's also missing an integral sign, I apologize, is from zero to one or minus one half to one half, it doesn't matter. Um, but I'm not integrating over the multiple times. So it's a redundancy, a lot like a gauge symmetry. Um, and to your first question, uh, we will see later exactly why this rounding term was so critical. Uh, and it's, this rounding term is what allows us to sidestep the uh, no-go theorem of Kapustin and Fikoski. Um, so I, I, you're really spot on there. Um, uh, sorry, I have a quick yeah. question. Uh, how, uh, sorry. Uh, so how, how, how do I write down this rounding function algebraically? Can we write it as some box 10, box 10 map from D2 to D4 or, or somehow? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't. Quite follow it, but I guess maybe if I think of the rounding function just as a function of x. Um, you know. Yeah, so, so, so I'm wondering because this rounding function doesn't quite show up in a usual algebraic topology. So I'm wondering if there's a more like a formal operator, for example, consider a box time mapping 
pull back from a oh. Z to Z N something. Yeah. Um. I haven't thought about it in terms of like like higher products, higher cut products, or something like that. But it probably is. Uh, I mean, if nothing else, it's the kernel of the map to U1, okay. right? So I, it really shows up there. Um, and in some sense, right, because I have my, my R uh, and this comes down to U1, right? And in fact, I can do uh, R, this is onto, this is injective. Um, so I can do something like that in a short exact sequence. Okay, thanks. Um, and just to clarify, S itself is not invariant under integer translations of phi, but K is defined such that E to the I S is invariant, right? That's exactly right. Okay. Um, which is ex very similar to like how we do churn simons level. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, and in fact, it's, it's kind of the same thing, which is what's so cool about this. Um, so there's one other property here that's maybe kind of interesting. Uh, in fact, not maybe, it, it will certainly be the, the name of the game is why there's a computing projector model for this. Um, and that's that the action is a total derivative, which seems kind of weird, right? Like uh, if, I, if I take this as a total derivative, there's, a, there's a, a, a chain rule here. So this D could come here and I could get D phi cup D D phi. That's my original action. And then it could go here, but that's a D squared and D squared is zero. So this action is a total derivative. Now, when I first saw this, I was, I was pretty uh, alarmed because every action that was a total derivative I've ever thought of was kind of trivial. But here's the thing, this action is U1 symmetric, but the thing which it is a total derivative of is not. So if you care about U1 symmetry, it's not trivial because it is not the derivative of anything which is U1 symmetric. However, it is trivial if you don't care about U1 symmetry. And that smells a lot like SPT order. And in fact is, and we'll see that more in just a minute. Um, in particular though, because it's formally a total derivative, it's sort of trivial on any closed space time, right? S is equal zero uh, whenever, cause I'm integrating D of something over a closed manifold. Well, I can integrate by parts. This goes over to nothing and S is equal zero. So there's really no ground state degeneracy. And my time evolution is simple. However, if I have an open manifold like I have here, the action that's a total derivative just assigns a wave function to any boundary. So now I've got something which is U1 symmetric, but not a total derivative of something which is U1 symmetric, even though it is a total derivative of something which breaks U1 symmetry. Its time evolution is trivial, uh, but on any boundary slice, it gives me a wave function. That sounds like an SPT order, and that sounds like a community projector model, and that's what it is. And, and now we're in the position to write that down. But before I get into that, any questions? Yeah, I guess so maybe this is like similar to Yuan's question, but like, so cochains on U1 are kind of weird because there's no like product structure on U1. And it, it just seems kind of strange that like a cup product you know, makes sense even. Yeah, that, so you know, how, how do I get away with like, you know, multiplying two things on U1? Well, really I'm lifting U1 to R and I'm doing all the multiplication in R where that multiplication is well-defined. Um, however, then now I have this rounding which is the kernel of the map back to U1. So I, I, it's a really good question. Um, and you know, when I first started getting the turn Simon's theory, I, I asked a lot, like how do we take the wedge product of two gauge one forms when this is a U1? And it's really that we're lifting it to R, just like we are in the continuum sense. Uh, question, um, could you say a few more words about how, how to see from looking at the action and uh, figure out whether those things are maybe an uh, SPT or invertible? It's not long range entangled or not. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to punt on that for just a second because we're about to see it perfectly. Uh, I think you're asking the exact right question at, at this time. So give me two slides on that. Okay, great. And I'll have a great answer. Um, uh, another quick question. Sorry. So I'm wondering if your action belongs to the standard group cohomology picture for Poisson SPT. Yeah, give me uh, six slides on that oh. one. It's a great question. Um, okay, sorry. No, no, this is the perfect question. Uh, 
the group cohomology picture for continuous groups is not well understood, um, or not necessarily not well understood, as much as there's still some uh, questions lingering about does, do the, do the co-cycles or do your co-chains need to be continuous or smooth? And certainly if they're smooth, you get nothing. Um, so this is an example of actually something that will be sort of discontinuous and that's the critical part. Um, so I've decided that in and I wanna come back to it. We need a little more technology before I, I, I think everything comes through. So let's jump into the community projector model. Uh, the secret to the community projector model is to spend as little time actually looking at the form of this projector as we can, just because it involves you know, one lattice site and all six of its neighbors. So it gets kind of messy. Um, but there's a, a nice standard way to go from a space-time path integral to a lattice, like a, a operator lattice formalism. Uh, and Victor, this goes to your question earlier. Um, what I do is I time evolve just a single lattice site. Uh, so I imagine I start with this black lattice here. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I'm gonna time evolve it to the blue lattice, which is just basically time evolving this site right here in the middle. I apologize, I'm still using blue, let me do red. So this site right here in the middle. I'm going from four to five. Um, and to do that, I just evaluate the action. Uh, and so if I do e to the i s on this complex, I get this uh, answer. And like I said, the key to this is to spend a little time working on the, with this as possible, but it's just a matrix element. And in fact, I can interpret this as an operator acting as on site four, and these will be the commuting projectors. So they're right here. They involve a lattice site and the six around it in a kind of geometric sense, I just evaluate that. Um, and, and that's really it. The rest of the slide is gonna be talking about how those three properties uh, we looked at basically make this a commuting projector model that's soluble and then connecting to exactly those questions about what makes this uh, an SBT state. Uh, and finally, like the implications for group cohomology. Uh, so with that, uh, I just, you know, these operators are nasty. Um, I like simple things. So, so let me just get a little intuition for it by first saying, you know, what happens if I set K equals zero? Well, then M four to five is one. And that's actually the projector onto zero angular momentum states. If now K is non-zero, then I'm sort of taking zero angular momentum states uh, and twisting them around by a phase which depends on all of the various uh, phi's in an area. Um, and so that's, that's this. So I start with zero angular momentum states and I just apply some operator that twists the phase. And now to your question, there's something very, very special about this operator. Um, so here we go again, here's the operator. Here are my ground states, or sorry, my product state, which is just a bunch of zero angular momentum. And I'm twisting it by this co-cycle. Um, this is a big operator over the whole lattice. I can split this out into the product over the whole lattice over every triangle of e to the i pi k phi cup d d phi evaluated on this triangle. Uh, and these are the operators that create my state. Now there's something critical about these. These operators individually, each one of them breaks you on symmetry, right? Because d phi here, well, that's okay, but this one's not. If I have all of these operators together on a closed manifold, that's what this is, then I can integrate this by parts, I get a d phi there, and I no longer break U1 symmetry. So it, this is a U1 symmetric state, but if you wanna decompose the circuit that creates it into local operators, you end up breaking U1 symmetry. Uh, and that is exactly the SBT order there. Um, it's one way to see it, and it connects directly to the fact that there's this churn number uh, that's well-defined. Um, sorry, let's take a pause here. So you had an overall D next to your action before, what happened to that? Yeah, so that D drops away. Uh, like th that D is a three-dimensional action acting on a, a you know, two plus one D space-time lattice. And it's D of something here. Here, I'm evaluating this on a 2D lattice and it's just the surface term. And that's here. So, uh, right, it's, it's really that like the dimensionality of my model shifted because I went from a space-time lattice with space and time, so two plus one, uh, and now I'm just space. So I need to lose one dimension and that's where the D went. 
Um, it's also just that like, you know, if I go back to this picture of a wave function on the surfaces, well, this is a surface term. So it's basically this term just on the surface uh, is another way to look at it. Okay. And if you're on a lattice, does the integral become a sum? Yes, it is um, a sum with certain signs that show up based on like uh, uh, a certain aspect of the lattice homology. Uh, I think an, an easy example of this is, you know, if, if I'm integrating something over this, uh, you know, I'm basically gonna do, uh, if I'm integrating something like around, like a flux, it would go around like that. And the signs sort of introduce that. The actual technology is, is a little uh, just messy. It, in fact, when I do all these calculations, I just like write it down the intuitive way and then check that it matches the math. Um, but it's exactly a sum over sort of all the tetrahedra. So, okay, it's, but are you just saying you're putting signs because the integral has a direction and the sum will need to have some minuses in the right places. Exactly, and the signs actually depend on these arrows that are hidden here. So it's like quantum doubles, kind of. I guess, I'm not, I'm not certain the about the baggage there. there. They have to, yeah. Okay, so, so then that psi there, that, that integral should be a sum. And now what are you saying about the terms in the sum, each individual term you're saying is not U1 invariant, but together they are? Exactly, that's exactly right. Um, um, maybe, I don't quite see that. So yeah. all the phi's, the terms in the, in the sum have a single phi. Oh, okay, so you're, you're, you're kicking each phi by an integer. Or actually, sorry, they're, they're, it's always invariant under that integer, but the U1 is kicking all of the phi's together by all the right, same okay. angle. Good, so you kick them by a, a theta and okay, so the so the the d phi clearly is invariant, but the first phi will give you an extra theta cup d d phi term, right? And then you have to do some sort of integration by parts. You said right to exactly. get the d over to the theta. Precisely. Okay. And that only works if I'm doing all of the operators together at once. So my I can you know. If I'm looking for a local operator to create this, they have to break U1. Um, okay. Or at least these operators do. Thanks. So that, that is exactly, I think, kind of the, the nice part of this model. So it really allows you to see that uh, in uh, action. Um, uh, hi, hi, Michael. One more question on that. You showed your proof of the uh, U1 symmetry of the action, was, but it was a little bit quick. Well, did that also only work for closed manifolds? Like was uh, it also up to a boundary? The three, the two plus one dimensional action is fine. Yeah. Um, so it's U one symmetric even on a even with boundary like you on a you know tetra cell by cell level. That's right. Um, huh. But then when you get to, I, I get careful here with my phrasing. So the three the two plus one dimensional action the three dimensional action is invariant on a cell by cell level. Then you get the the operators that create the ground state. Um, which is the boundary of uh, my space time. Where did I put that? Yes. And here, you know, those are invariant only all together. So if my, my boundary of space time itself has a boundary, so if there's a one dimensional boundary to the two dimensional boundary of space time, which can't happen, but let's not worry about that for a second, then you would break you one symmetry. Um, and if you're familiar with the story about anomalies that I've largely dropped, that's the reflection of that. Um, yeah, that right. There's an anomaly helpful, of the boundary. It works out really well. I, I think it's one of the things I really like about this model. Um, but we're not really getting into boundaries today. Um, so I think we're coming near to the end of time here. So I just want to make a couple points um, at the end. One is like how important the fact that this is formally a surface term. Even if it's a, a derivative of something which is not U1 symmetric, the fact it's formally a surface term is what makes those wave functions, makes it like have a well-defined wave function. It's also what makes it a commuting projector model. I'm just going to do the first one here, but you know what makes it commuting is the way I created those operators was I have time evolved a single site, but now I can imagine time evolving two of them, and I could do red or blue then red, or I could do red then blue. But the action only cares about the values of the field around the outside, so these are both equal to just the values of the field on the outside. Well, the values of the field on the outside are the same, so it's equal. 
And in fact, you can trace it out. And in the paper, we do all of this in the appendices because um, it, it's quite grueling to actually do the actual uh, expansion, but the geometric reason for why these commute is the action as a, as a surface term. Uh, and that's, I think, you know, really the critical thing. Basically the same story happens again with why it's Hermitian and why they are projectors. Um, and together, I now have my commuting Hermitian projector model, and I now have my ground state, and I can, you know, write it down explicitly. I can take a Hamiltonian to get a gap, uh, and, and that's it. I now have my wave function. The last question uh, we have to kind of look at is, uh, how does this wave function have Hall conductance? I'm going to jump straight into that because we're coming right to the end of time, um, unless there's any real critical questions. So with that, let, let me just jump in to kind of illustrate the, this calculation. Um, you know, I want to go back to my holonomy torus, my boundary condition torus. So I'm twisting the boundary conditions in the x and the y directions. And I can write down my wave function as a function of these. And the nice thing about this model is I can actually explicitly do this. Uh, it's slightly longer than I can do in a talk, but it's, it's perfectly suited for the appendix of the paper. Um, and I can then you know, figure out what happens if I go around the torus um, yeah, by an integer time. And in the paper we show, you know, it's up to some phase factor, the original state. And really what this is telling me is I look at this phase factor, it's here. Uh, that is exactly the boundary conditions for a particle on a torus in a magnetic field. So if I have a magnetic field coming out of the torus and I have a particle on it, um, then these are the boundary conditions we end up applying. And this is the case for flux K. And that's really telling me from the TK and in picture that uh, the flux is indeed uh, quantized. Uh, I now have a churn number and there's Hall conductance. There's another way to look at the Hall conductance that I don't have the time for here. And that's coupling it to a background gauge field and actually seeing the churn Simon's response. Uh, and we do that as well in the paper. Uh, it's slightly more, more complicated. But the nice thing about this picture is it immediately sets me up to talk about how we get around that no-go theorem. And this is really, I think, to your point, Victor, why the um, uh, uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert space is so critical. And to another question, you know, what's going on with this rounding term? Well, when I do this calculation, uh, I'm going to have a point, let me go back for a second, where I, I have a theta y that goes across the boundary. And so if my wave function was something like phi cup d d phi, you know, there's going to be a theta y in here at some point. And so explicitly, this wave function does not depend smoothly on theta y. But that is the assumption of the no-go theorem. The no-go theorem says, well, hey, if I have a Hamiltonian that depends, that depends smoothly on theta x and theta y, should I not then get this bundle that depends smoothly on theta x and theta y? But here the answer is resolutely no. Uh, there is some sort of like uh, uh, non-smoothly changing phase factor there. Uh, and that's how it steps right around the no-go theorem. And that's related finally to this idea of uh, discontinuous group co-cycles. So if you're not into group cohomology, I don't, I, I don't think it's critical for this, this section, but I wanna just include this because it's such a big deal uh, for us on the condensed matter side. And because it came from the mind of someone who was explicitly trained in quantum matter, and that's uh, Shagun's former student, uh, Chia Chen, who's now at Caltech. Um, you know, she, she realized that the, the group cohomology was a way to think about the classification of phases. A group cohomology is the study of group co-cycles. And what those are, are some sort of action that takes in group variables, you know, like ours, um, that where D of this action is zero. And certainly that's true because this action is a total derivative. And if so, if I hit it with another d, d squared is zero. But you study these things up to the d of something. So you say, well, I study actions up to the point, I make them equivalent if they differ by a total derivative of something which is allowed. But this is a total derivative of something which is not allowed because this something is not u1 symmetric. So this is something which is, you know, a discontinuous group co-cycle. If you're familiar with the terminology, it's called not a co-boundary because what is you know, a total derivative breaks you on symmetry. And so really this is an example of SPT phases classified by group cohomology, but you have to consider a non-smooth co-cycles. Um, 
In fact, there's a mathematical result and there's been a question hanging around for a while saying, well, if you do group cohomology with smooth co-cycles or continuous ones, uh, you get nothing. It's a trivial classification of phases of matter, but we know there are U1 SVT phases. So what could be going on? Well, you have to extend that uh, to include discontinuous group co-cycles. And this is, I, I, as far as I know, the first example of that in a really nice way. So that brings me, I think, to the end. Uh, and hopefully we are a couple minutes late, I'm sorry. Um, I, just to quickly review, you know, we saw this, this, this space-time rotor model. Uh, and the, the key part of it was it had this rotor symmetry, which made it quantized. And it was U1 symmetric. And it was a total derivative of something, which is not U1 symmetric. Uh, so that's what made it easy to solve, but still non-trivial. And we took that straight into the commuting projector model. Um, and we saw all of those same things rise back up. And those are really what made it soluble. Um, I want to take questions in just a moment. But first, I want to share a couple of the questions that I'm thinking about, because I, I think that this is really just the door opening. Um, so in particular, you know, we talked about quantum magic, about things being ground states of commuting projector models. And this was something which should never, you know, I certainly thought would never be a ground state of a commuting projector model. So, so what am I missing? Uh, it might be that the situation of infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces is just much more complicated uh, and maybe, you know, much nicer to work in in some respects. I don't know. Um, that's something I'm thinking a lot about. Sort of related to that uh, is, you know, the discontinuous nature of this only makes sense with an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Like you could never get it from, from a finite dimensional one because there's no sense of continuity there. Um, so I think that's a really interesting question as well as how this all plays together. Um, one last one that sits on my mind a lot is, you know, if I, if I create this ground state with a, a, a turn number K, uh, I can't de de deform it into K prime so long as I break U1 symmetry or, you know, keep the gap open. So that's another uh, interesting question. And of course, I'm always thinking as lattice field theorists, you know, could we ever generalize this to non-abelian groups? Uh, those are some of the mind, things on my mind. Uh, now I, I want to learn what your questions are and, and say thank you again for having me. I, I really appreciate it. So Let's uh, thank Michael uh, by unmuting and uh, awkwardly clapping in three, two, one. Thank y'all. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for uh, uh, trying to digest this in a way that could be amenable, not just to people who already know this language. Um, I say we um, we go straight to Gather Town before people start to leave and ask questions. Uh,